Chapter six of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bria Snow. Chapter six Conscientiousness. There is such a want of conscientiousness among mankind, even among those who are professedly good people, that one might almost be pardoned for concluding that there is either no conscience in the world, or that the heavenly monitor is at least nowhere fully obeyed for is there not too much foundation for such a conclusion while well, truth compels it to admit that christianity has already done much to awaken the consciences of men we shall gain nothing by shutting our eyes to the vast influence it has yet to exert before mankind will become what they ought to be most people are conscientious in some things they may have been so trained for instance that they are quite tender in regard to the feelings of others and even those of animals there are many who with cowper would not enter on their list of friends the man who needlessly sets foot upon a worm who were yet very far from possessing much real conscientiousness their feeling is better entitled to the name of sympathy i grant that many of these people possess something more than mere tenderness or sympathy not a few of them are truly conscientious in what may be called the larger concerns of life especially in external religion they not only feel the force of conscience but they obey her voice in some things they would not fail to attend to all the outward rites of religion in the most faithful manner on any account whatever and if a failure should occur would find their consciences reproaching them in the severest manner for their departures from a known standard of duty these persons regard with a considerable degree of conscientiousness the law of the land and the law of public opinion or at least the law of fashion in respect to anything which would subject them to the severity of public remark or which would even be regarded by the coarse public eye as glaringly inconsistent with their religious character they are never wanting in sensibility their consciences reproach them when they have done or said anything which may cause them to be spoken ill of thus far it cannot be denied that there is a great deal of conscientiousness in the world but beyond limits something like these it is much more rare than many suppose to say that it does not exist beyond such narrow limits would be unjust but it must be admitted that taking the world at large its existence is so rare as hardly to entitle it to the name of a living moving breathing principle of action i do not suppose that young women are less conscientious than young men or that the young of either sex are less conscientious than their seniors it would be a novel if not unheard of thing to find the youth without conscience merging in due time into the conscientious octogenarian the contrary is the more common cause and yet how few are the young women who make it a matter of conscience to perform everything they do the smaller no less than the larger matters of life in such a way as to meet the approbation of an internal monitor do they not generally bow to the tribunal of a fashionable world do they generally care sufficiently in the everyday actions words thoughts and feelings of their lives what god's vicegerent in the soul says about their conduct or if they do care is it because it is right or wrong in the sight of god or of man a due regard to the authority of conscience would lead people as it seems to me to yield obedience to her dictates on every occasion they who disregard her voice in one thing are likely to do so in others who does not know the power of habit who will deny that the individual who habitually disregards the voice speaking within on a particular subject will be likely ere long to extend the same habit of disregard to something else and thus on to the end of the chapter if there be any end to it no one it is believed will doubt that i have rightly described the tendency of habit in large matters he who would allow himself to steal from day to day unmindful of the voice within which bids him beware would not only ere long if unmolested come to a point at which conscience would cease to reproach him but would be likely to venture upon other kinds of wrong i have seen those who would habitually steal small things and yet would not tell a lie for the world but i have also known the habit of stealing continue until lying also gradually came to be a habit was scarcely thought of as offensive in the sight of god or as positively wrong in the nature of things any more than picking up a basket of pebbles 
from lying the natural transition is to profanity and so on until conscience chased up and down like the last lonely deer of a forest at length exhausted faints and dies few i say will deny the tendency and power of habit in regard to the larger matters of life but is it sufficiently known that every act which can possibly be regarded as fraudulent even in the smallest degree has the same tendency there are a thousand things that people do which cannot be set down as absolutely criminal in the view of human law or human courts and which are not forbidden in any particular chapter or verse of the divine law which notwithstanding are forbidden by the spirit of both human law no less than divine law requires us to love our neighbour as ourselves. is the law obeyed when we make the smallest approach to taking that advantage of a neighbour which we would not like to have taken of us in similar circumstances those who admit and seem to understand the power of habit in large matters are yet prone to forget the tendency of habitual disregard of right and wrong in small matters they are by no means ignorant that large rivers are made up of springs and rills and brooks but they do not seem to consider that the larger stream of conscientiousness must also be fed by its thousand tributaries or it will never flow or once flowing will be likely soon to cease in other words to be conscientious truly so in the larger and more important concerns of life we must be habitually and i had almost said religiously so in smaller matters in our most common and everyday concerns would that nothing worse were true than that people of all ranks and professions and of all ages and conditions habitually and with less and less compunction or regret do that which they know they ought not to do and leave undone that which they very well know ought to be done for they even seem to justify themselves in it i know the right and i approve it too i know the wrong and yet the wrong pursue is the language of many an individual even of some from whom we could hope better things and not a few charge yet upon the frailty of fallen nature as that nature now is independent of and in spite of their own efforts strange infatuation one way of solving this great riddle in human life and conduct this incessant doing by mankind of that which they know they ought not to do and neglecting to do that which they know ought to be done may be found in the fact that so few are trained to regard in everything the sacred rights of conscience they are referred to other and more questionable standards of authority if you do so and so you will never be a lady says a mother who wishes to dissuade her young daughter from doing something to which she is inclined if you behave so everybody will laugh at you says another if you do not obey me i shall punish you says a third if you don't do that i shall tell mother says a younger brother or sister if you do not do it father will give you no sugar toys when he comes home the child is again told if you don't mind me the bears will come and eat you up says the petulant nurse or maid-servant thus in one way or another and at one time or another every motive love fear selfishness pleasure etc is appealed to in the education of the young except that which should be chiefly appealed to viz self-approbation or the approbation of conscience this is not all there is with many of these people no settled rule as to what sort of actions are to be the subjects of praise or of blame a thing which must not be done to-day on penalty of the loss of the forthcoming sugar toys is connived at perhaps with a kiss to-morrow all in the child's mind is confusion she knows not what to do where she is docile and obedient as an angel of light there is a long series of actions words thoughts and feelings connected with right and wrong of which nothing is ever said except to forbid them by stern and absolute authority that one is good and another bad except according to the whim or fancy of the parent or teacher the child never suspects of this last class are almost all the actions of everyday life the child alluded to is scolded at times for default in matters which pertain to rising dressing saying prayers eating drinking playing speaking running teasing or soiling its clothes and or books and a thousand things too familiar to every one to render it necessary to repeat perhaps she eats too much or eats greedily or she inclines to be slovenly or indolent or fretful now all these things are in general 
merely forbidden or rated or at most shown to be contrary to the will of the parents they are seldom or never shown to be right or wrong in their own nature nor is the child assured upon the authority of the parent that there is a natural right or wrong to them thus that which is not implanted does not of course grow all the little actions and concerns of life or almost all and these by their number and frequent recurrence make up almost the whole of a child's existence are as it were left wholly without the domain of conscience and the young woman goes up to maturity without a distinct conviction that conscience has anything to do with them and what is bred in the bone according to a vulgar maxim stays long in the flesh as is the child so is the adult it has been one of the most difficult things in the world to make a person conscientious in all things who has not been trained to be so hence the great difficulty in the way of making everyday christians our religion is thought by some to have nothing to do with these ever-recurring small matters and when we are told that we should do everything to the honour and glory of god although we may assent to the proposition it is hard to put it into practice there is a sort of moral palsy prevailing in the community and that too very extensively no fatal error of early education could have seized more firmly or palsied more effectually the moral sensibilities of the whole community than this and therefore it is certain that this is at least one principal reason why there is so little conscience in the world and why it is so often a starveling wherever it is found to exist i have heard an eminent teacher contend with much earnestness that there is a great multitude of the smaller actions of human life which are destitute of character wholly so they are he says neither right nor wrong but if so then there is no responsibility attached to them and co consequently no conscientiousness required in connection with their due performance but what in that case is to become of the injunction of a distinguished apostle when he says whatever you do do all to the glory of god if everything we do should be done to the glory of god and not thus to do it is to disobey a righteous precept then there is a right and wrong in everything now which shall we believe the human teacher or the divine this origin of a common error i have deemed it necessary for every young woman to understand that she may know how to apply the correction and where to begin she should love and respect her parents even if they belong to the class which has been described she should consider the present imperfect state of human nature and be thankful for the thousand benefits she has received at their hands and the various means of improvement within her reach if she has drunk deeply of the desire for improvement and if she wishes to know and reform herself as far as possible let her begin by cultivating to the highest possible degree a sense of right and wrong and an implicit and unwavering obedience to the right before closing this chapter however i wish to present a few illustrations of my meaning when i say that everything should be done in a conscientious manner perhaps indeed i am already sufficiently understood but lest i should not be by all i subjoin the following suppose a young woman is in the habit of lying in bed late in the morning in view of her varied responsibilities and of the vast importance of rising early and with a strong desire for continual improvement she sets herself to change the habit now to aid her in the task for it is no light one let her endeavour to consider the whole matter god gives us sleep she will perhaps say to herself for the restoration of our bodies and minds and all the time really necessary for this is well employed but i found that i feel better and actually enjoy myself better for the whole day following when by accident or by other means i have slept an hour less than i am accustomed to do so i usually sleep nine hours or more whereas i am quite sure eight are sufficient for every reasonable purpose moreover if i sleep an hour too much that hour is wasted have i a right to waste it it is god's gift is it not slighting his gift to spend it in sleep is it not a sin and to do so day after day and year after year is it not to make myself exceedingly guilty in his sight one hour daily stay for the purpose of reading or study after the, a person has really slept enough is equal in sixteen years to the addition of a full year to one's life can it be that i waste in sleep 
in fifteen or sixteen years a whole year of time i must do so no longer it injures my complexion it injures my health it is an indolent practice but above all it is a sin against god i am resolved to redeem my time and to aid me in this work i am determined if i fail in any instance to remember this decision and the grounds on which it was made she carries out her decision she finds herself waking too late occasionally it is true however she not only hurries out of the bed the instant she wakes but recalls her former view of the sinfulness of her conduct she is no sooner dressed than she asks pardon for her transgression and prays that she may transgress no more this course she continues and thus her convictions of the sinfulness of her former indolent habit and waste of time are deepened at length by her persevering efforts and the assistance of god she gains the victory and a new and better habit is completely established just so it should be with any other bad habit every young woman should consider it as a sin against god and should begin the work of reformation as a duty not only to herself and to others but also and more especially to god if it be nothing but the error of eating too much which by the way is not so small an error as many seem to suppose let her try to regard it in its true light as a transgression against the laws of god let it be so regarded not merely once or twice but habitually in this way it will soon become as in the case of early rising a matter of conscience the close of the day however is an especially important season for cultivating the habit of conscientiousness sleep is the image of death as some have said and if so we may consider ourselves at bedtime as standing on the borders of the grave where all things should look serious the cool of the day is peculiarly adapted to reflection let every one at this time recall the circumstances of the day and consider wherein things have been wrong it was a sacred rule among the pythagoreans every evening to run thrice over in their minds the events of the day and shall christians do less than heathen the pythagoreans did more than cultivate a habit of recalling their errors they asked themselves what good they had done so should we we should remember that it is not only sinful to do wrong but it is also sinful to admit to do right the young woman who fears that she has said something in regard to a fellow being in a certain place or in certain company which she ought not to have said as it may do that person injury should remember that not to have said something when a favourable opportunity offered which might have been done a companion or neighbour good was also equally wrong and above all she should remember that both the commission and the omission were sins against that god who gave her a tongue to do good with and not to do harm and not only to do good with but to do the greatest possible amount of good in short it should be the constant practice of every one who has the love of eternal improvement strongly implanted in her bosom to consider every action performed during the day as sinful when it has not been done in the best possible manner whether it may have been one thing or another as i have stated repeatedly elsewhere there is nothing worth doing at all which should not be done to the honour and glory of god and she who would attain to the highest measure of perfection should regard nothing as done in this manner which is not done exactly as god her saviour would have done it it is desirable not only to avoid benumbing or searing over the conscience but that we should cultivate it to the highest possible tenderness true these tender consciences are rather troublesome but is it not better that they should torture us a little now than a great deal hereafter i have said that some good people that is those who are comparatively good fall short in this matter a young woman is a teacher perhaps in a sabbath school she knows full well the importance of attending promptly at the appointed hour she makes it a point thus to attend at last she fails on a single occasion not from necessity but from negligence or at least from want of due care and her conscience at once reproaches her for the conduct but ere long the offence is repeated the reproaches of her conscience though still felt have become less keen the offence is repeated again and again till conscience is almost seared over and the omission of what had at first given pain almost ceases to be troublesome and thus the conscience having been blunted in one respect is more liable to be so in others alas for the individual who is thus from day to day growing worse and yet from day to day becoming less sensible of it 
but there is a worse case than i have yet mentioned a young woman who has risen rather late on sunday morning and having risen late other things are liable to relate the hour for church is at length near the bell is even ringing something in the way of dress not very necessary except to comply with fashions and yet on the whole desirable still remains to be done during the remaining five minutes but what is more important still the habit of secret prayer for five minutes before going to church is uncomplied with one of these the closet or the dress must be neglected for want of time does any one doubt which it will be does any one doubt that the dress will receive the desired attention and the closet will be neglected but does any one suppose that conscientiousness can live and flourish where it is not only not cultivated but habitually violated in regard to the most sacred matters secret prayer is one of the most sacred duties and they who habitually neglect or violate it for the self of doing that which is of secondary importance knowing it to be so and not only taking the sure course to eradicate all conscientiousness from their bosoms but are more manifestly preferring the world to god and the love and service of the world to the love and service of its glorious creator and redeemer let me say in concluding this chapter that if the conscience is cultivated from day to day it will in time acquire a degree of tenderness and accuracy to which most of the world are entire strangers there is however one more thing conscience will not only become more tender and faithful but her domain will be much enlarged by the study of the bible and in many cases in which this heavenly monitor was once silent she will now utter her warning voice conscience is not unalterable as some suppose she is susceptible of elevation as long as we live and happy is the individual who elevates her to her rightful throne happy is the individual who sees things most nearly as god sees them and whose conscience condemns her in every thing which is contrary to the divine will End of chapter six